Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you. Such a blessed day. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. 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 It's you know it's getting that time of year, and and this is my this is my problem sometimes with Halloween and and Thanksgiving and it, it's it's the time of year when everyone says, all right, it's okay to get fat and happy and, and eat and eat and eat and eat and you know, I like to eat. Uh, there's one thing anyone knows about me is I'm not, don't call me late for dinner. I'm always there for dinner. I'm always the first one ready to eat. And, and even when I eat, I'm ready to eat some more. Um, and that's why I go on vacation, so I can just have a, a spurge of eating. But there comes those times in our lives when, when it's, um, it's, to, it's to take the flesh and put it aside and, and every once in a while just so we can focus on those things that aren't carnal that aren't appetizing to the flesh and to the eyes as we're, especially nowadays when we're just inundated with social media. I mean, it's nonstop. We're sitting there and, and we're like this. Even in our relationships, we'll be at dinner and, and, and we're sitting there and Lisa's on her phone and then I'll pop up my phone and we're, this is an intimate time where we're supposed to be spending together and yet here we are looking for text messages and waiting for the next, you know, tickle of, of that appetite. But, but there's something special when you just say, I'm going to fast. I'm going to stop from these internal and, and, and fleshly things that are filling me and, and, and eating my appetite. I'm going to cast aside these things. But the problem is, the instant you start doing that, what's the first thing you start thinking of? Food. Food, right? I mean, it's food. You start, I, I remember the Seinfeld episode when they were, uh, they were up on the roof and they were trying to um, get suntans. And, and, and they were actually put butter on themselves and Kramer came down and, and Newman's looking at him and he looks like a big turkey and, and, and he's, he's licking his lips like he wants to eat him. And, and, and you know, when you start fasting, you start getting these deep groanings. When you start denying the flesh what it needs and what it thinks it needs, I should say, and what it wants, it starts to rear up its head and it's, and it's a groaning in your stomach. People are looking at you like there's something wrong because it's an earthquake going on inside your stomach. And, 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 and in the beginning of that fasting time, it's difficult. It's so hard. And, and yet, think of it as you're now yet, as we learned in the last scripture verses, the whole earth and all creation, as it says in Romans chapter 8 in the last sections of the scriptures we were reading, groans, yearns for what's to come. You're groaning for that next meal, and you just want it. That's just the flesh, but the spirit is still groaning for the things that are to come. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel beaten down, frustrated with the struggles of this world? You're seeing them all around you, just yearning and groaning inside you. I want this done. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of failing. I'm tired of falling again. And again, and again, my sin nature within me, it's a struggle. And that battle, as we begin in Romans chapter 8, verse 23, it says, Paul speaking, and not only they, not only the world, not all these things that are groaning, not only the universe that's groaning for God to come back and set things at right, but he says, not only they, but ourselves also, us Christians, all the more that we've tasted the love of God, we've tasted that eternal hope that's coming. We want it even more. It's inside of us groaning to burst forth, and it says, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. We are now tasting those eternal things by the Spirit of God who is within you, calling you to these things. Evermore, always, constantly, wooing us, showing us, revealing it. Yet it's a taste. We're not there yet. We see, Paul says it through a dim-lit lens. Even the greatest of us, even the greatest theologians, those walking so far, doing everything perfect, only see God as through a dim-lit lens. But we see it and we want it. I want more of you, God. This is what I know. This is what my spirit's bearing and saying, please give me this. I want to be holy as you are holy. I want to be in a world that's holy. It's not filled with lie and deception. And as we're entering into Halloween, this time of seducing spirits, 
This time of darkness, subduing and wooing people into darkness. I don't want this anymore. I want nothing to do with darkness. I want to be light as you are light. And yet there's a battle there, isn't there? Yes. There's a battle. We look at, in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 19. I want to encourage you, if you're in this struggle between the flesh and and the yearning of the spirit, of the things to come, you're not alone. We touched on this in, previous, in the previous chapter, Romans chapter 7, verse 19. Paul, knowing the scriptures inside and out, trying to do all those things that are perfect prior in the law, now walking in even the grace, striving to enter into the rest of what's already been done, and now wanting to enter into this, He's a, there's a battle, and Paul talks about this also, where he says, I'm betwixt two places. I'm here on this earth doing this will of God, and yet I just want to be home with Jesus. I want to be home with God in heaven. And in this chapter, in chapter 7, he says, verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that which I would not, it is no longer me or I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. You see, guys, we all have this struggle, this battle, this burning within us to be better, to look past what we're in, this world, this dark place, and to strive for the prize which is ahead, the eternal blessings of God Almighty, which are promised. We're not there yet, though. Do you guys have that groaning deep down inside? Is that burning in you, then you're, you, you could be a Christian who's wanting more, hungry for more, thirsty for more, in this time of fasting, but the Lord has prepared a banquet that's coming. Hang in there. Hang in there. As we go through today's sermon, we're going to hit on eight points. Eight points to help you through this groaning phase. This time that is just a vapor, the Lord says, that we're here on this earth. This time that as a flower fades that quickly, we'll be with God in heaven. Think about it. It's just that much. You can do it. God's got you here for a purpose. So as we continue on in scripture verses, beginning in verse four, uh, continuing on in verse 14 of Romans chapter 8, it says, I want to make sure I don't read the wrong chapter here. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 24. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for putting me in my right place. Um, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? This is the first point to help us through this. What? Hope. Hope. Hope is important. Hope is not hope like the world, like I hope I get a cool Christmas present for any of those that are interested. I'll give you my list, I'll put it out there, and I hope I get that. Mm -hmm. I hope I get some turkey for Thanksgiving. No, no, no. This is, I am assured of something that's going to come because God said it. But still, hope is a tough thing, isn't it? Hope is, hope is um, something that, that can be difficult. As we read on that, in that verse, it's saying that in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, Hope that is delayed is a despair. When I'm waiting for something and it doesn't happen, it's frustrating, isn't it? I, my poor brother, um, Steve, he he's, took his car in for something simple, and it turned out he needed a whole new engine. Well, guess what? Because of COVID and everything, there weren't building engines. So they finally got the engine after a, a month or more, and now they're saying it, it's going to be shipped. It's been two weeks. Can you imagine the anticipation? I just want this. I know I'm going to get it, but it's the waiting. It's the waiting that's hard, isn't it? It's the difficulty of waiting. And so hope, yet, is a glorious thing as well. As we think of the scripture verses, um, 1 Corinthians verse 5, uh, chapter 15, verse 16, it says, for, in, for if the dead rise not, then it is Christ that is not Christ raised. If and if Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. They then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in the life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men but miserable. 
If, there's, if this is it, and there is no resurrection, and what Christ says, then we're in a hopeless state. I'm going to starve to death. I'm done. Right? Isn't that how it is? But it says in verse 20 of that same chapter, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of, of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as Adam all things die, even so in Christ all things shall live. Hope. Hope. Hope that this is not it. Hope that when I die, there's more. A blessing that's ahead for me because of Christ. That's a hope. That's an assurance, right? Romans 8, chapter 11, talk, or verse 11 is talking about this. If you remember back in our other lesson. But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies and by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Do you see all of a sudden as you're groaning, there's this, there's this um, constant whisper of hope. For every step you take, that you're going to a better place, that there's a direction. This is not going to last forever. The storm will pass. And the beautiful thing is, is as you get older, you forget a lot more. And, and I think because you've lived longer, it's a smaller portion of your life. Time flies. So those times of waiting go faster and faster and faster and faster. You see, we actually are picking up momentum. Yeah, it's hard to say. You know, when you get older, you don't feel that way. But you're actually... Spinning faster and running to the Lord. Waiting in his arms. He's waiting with his arms wide open. You're getting there. Hang in there. Hope is, hope is something that, that keeps you moving with the assurance of what's ahead. I'm going to get there. There is a finish line. There is an end to this madness. <laughs> Amen? And of course, we'll talk about another part of hope later in verse um, 28. But, but as we said... Hope delayed can cause misery in our hearts, can cause sorrow, can cause groanings, mournings. I want it now. I need it now. Isn't that how a child is? I want it now. I want that candy now. Why do you think the seducing spirits of the holiday coats it with candy? I want it now. As you're going out, think about this. Some of you once were entangled in witchcraft in sorcery, in strong delusions. And here we are taking our children, God's children, out to glorify death. Here, put some candy on it. And reinforcing them with positive reinforcement of candy, saying, this is beautiful, isn't it? And don't, doesn't our flesh yearn for that? But deep inside, the Spirit's groaning for that to be gone. I never want to see that again. Because those that have been walked in, that have walked in the truth of that have been hurt, have been led astray, have been left in despair, have been vulnerable and said, I've been beaten by that. That lie of death. I want nothing to do with it anymore. You see the struggle here? You see the, the battle? The spiritual battle that's being waged while we're here, there's a reason, but there's hope that we win. We have victory. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Amen? Mm -hmm. We have victory in this battle. We've already won. Now let's fight. <laughs> it's kind of backwards, but let's do it. Let's enter into that. So but, but what does that take? Let's continue on in our scripture verses. Number two in verse 25. It says... As he saith also to Hosea, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. <laughs> These pages got stuck together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank God for wives, amen? Yes. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but if we have hope, but if we have hope for that, we see not that we do not have patience to wait for it. Okay, so what helps us get over that bearing? Patience. Number two, patience. Patience is a hard one. I, I hear people in the church, and I've been there, where they say, don't pray for patience, because when you pray for patience, trials are going to come. It's kind of like a, a conundrum, right? Because you're saying, I want to get out of these struggles. I want them to end. But in order to, in order to get out of them, I need to have patience. In order to have patience, I need to go through them. Sounds like a, a, a Pandora's box, doesn't it? 
But the Lord says that patience is what's going to help you get through and give you the hope. You need to season your hope with patience. What does that mean? Waiting on the Lord. Everyone here knows Isaiah 40, 31 by heart probably, right? Those that wait upon the Lord will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Right? Romans chapter 5, verse 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Hope. The more you've been in it, been there, done that, the more confidence I have God's going to pull me through it again. Amen? Why are we dead Christians? Why are we staying clear of the battlefield when it's in the battlefield we'll see our weaknesses made strong by him? He will lift you up. Why are you steering clear of marriage? It's too hard. See all these videos. I'm not getting married. You know, I've been married and divorced twice and so now I just live with the person. You're steering clear of the battle. Marriage can be a battle, but it's in marriage where we see the knitting of the spirit of God between two souls. Where love conquers all things. Where we are one in God. Where a three-strong cord is not easily broken. Amen. Amen? It's where we see God's strength. It's where we receive true counseling. Not from men and women, but from the Spirit of God who dwells within you. James chapter 1 verse 4 says, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect Wanting nothing. What does that say? It says in the midst of this groaning and this hunger, there's something that can satisfy that hunger. That can give me an assurance to endure through. To persevere in well-doing. Patience. It's these trials and the confidence of walking with God hand in hand. You know, I think of Halloween. I don't know if you can notice I'm peppering some Halloween stuff through this. But I was trying to think, how am I going to bring this into the message? But it, it, the Lord's been speaking to me all week about Halloween. That's why I'm peppering these in, because I think it's for every single one of us. But what does David say in Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Right? Yes. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Shall we do some mercy? So follow me all the days of my life. I'll be leasing these sights to water. Who? We're holding our Father's hand in the midst of this struggle, in the yearnings, in the groanings. He's not left us. Right. Be patient. Be patient on the Lord. Trust his, his perfect. This is, this is going to snowball and get better and better. Let's continue on. Verse 26. Verse 26. There's many more on patience, but we just don't have time. So let's go, let's go up to verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought to, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What's number three? You're not alone. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit is opening your eyes just as he did before you were saved, and he opened your eyes to the truth beyond the lies, beyond the darkness, beyond death, and he showed you eternal heaven. Now he's continually showing you that. Showing you sin and the nature of it, the lie of it. You know, it, it, it's easy to walk through callously. And I'm not telling people here not to go trick-or-treating. I'm not sitting here trying to bash Halloween. I'm trying to say, are you walking in the spirit and truth of what is out there? And are you being a light? In the darkness. Are you holding your father's hand through the valley of the shadow of death? Or are you saying, I got this, God, and I'm going to go play in Satan's playground? That's what I'm trying to say here. The Holy Spirit reminds you of the lie of what's out there. That there's an enemy who's looking and seeking whom he may destroy. Ready to pounce. The Holy Spirit not only does that, but he counsels. That's what that word literally means when you read it in that scripture verse. He's saying he's our counselor. He's, he's our helper. He tells us those things that no man need teach us. 
As we open up the Word of God, He brings revelation to those things that are only understood by God the Holy Spirit who inspired them. The author. Who better to go to than the author for your counseling? The other thing is, the Holy Spirit is, what's he saying here? Prayer. This prayer, this praying, coming together in relationship is only possible because you are a child. You are a, a, a fruit of the Spirit. You are one of God's children. You're in a relationship where you can come to God. And what did we learn last week? Say, Abba Father. Thank you. You weren't even here. High five, Ronnie. Abba Father. It's a relationship. We, we are knitted in the spirit of God. We are one with God. Christ says, as I am one with the Father, you are one with me. We are one. Holy Spirit knitted. I'm groaning. I'm one with God. He's with me. He's not left us orphaned, but he's given us a helper. A helper, the Holy Spirit, tightly knitted. And what does it say? It goes on to say this. And this is scripture verses which can be taken out of context a lot. And, and I don't have a whole lot of time to go into this, but this is a whole study in and of itself. But he says, that, and we'll get into this a little more in a couple of scriptures, but he says that he makes intercession on your behalf. Where you fall short, God makes up the difference. More than that, God covers you. <laughs> God does it all. Even in your prayers, he tells us to come to him and give us your, everything that you're groaning about. Give it to me. Dump it on my feet. I know you sinned again and again and again. I already knew your frailties before you knew them. I exposed them and showed you your weakness, and now I've come to cover them completely. My brother said before service started, love covers a multitude of sin. I've come to show you my position. You're my son. You're my daughter. Talk with me. Talk with me. Who's, who are the children talking with now? Social media. Just read an article the other day. It said that women in particular, young women in particular, are, are going into severe depression are going into severe suicidal thoughts and tendencies. They're being duped by the devil because of this innovation of what they're letting into their eyes and their ears. Be careful, little children, what you see, right? Amen? Be careful what you let your ears. And parents are driving them there to social media. Now they're going to make it even more cool. Let's make it 3D so they can tell even less reality from truth. Let's go trick or treat. You better be holding your child's hand. These are God's children. Amen? These are God's children. But this groaning from within, the Lord says he makes up that difference. I'm going to bridge the gap between what you're thinking and you cannot put into words. Have you ever been there? You're groaning so much, but you just can't put your finger on it. It's like that gnawing pain, but you don't even know where it is. You're trying to find it, and you're running around your back. I know i got a pain here somewhere. It's driving me crazy. Well, the Lord knows where that pain is. You can't even put it into words. But the Lord already knows your thoughts before you even think them. And the Holy Spirit's already interceding on your behalf for the prayers to align you in God's perfect will for you. Pretty cool, huh? Holy Spirit. Let's continue on with scripture verses. It says, which cannot be uttered with groanings. There are those, I, I want to touch on this real quick. There are those that, that use this to describe the gift of tongues. Because the other part of the Holy Spirit is he gives you gifts. He gives you gifts. To teach, to preach, to sing, to worship, to do all things to knit the body together, to help each other, to see God, to reveal God. So what the Spirit's doing is coming in you and, and revealing himself in you and allowing you to have a gift to reveal to the rest of the church. Well, Paul rebuked the church in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 for the gift of tongues, which is for the edification of you. I'm sitting there and I'm praying and I don't even know what to say and I'm groaning in the Spirit. And the Spirit of God is speaking in the tongues of angels on your behalf. And it's a miracle. It's an awesome thing because you can feel literally the groanings go away. 
Because that connection with God extinguishes those pains. That satisfaction of that relationship, that bond is immediately revealed. Light extinguishes the darkness within you. But there's a speaking of tongues, and people have taken that and twisted it. And they start taking it and using it to puff themselves up in front of the church. Look at me, I speak in this weird language. But Paul said, that's if you have no interpreter who knows what you're even speaking about, then what does that edify? How is that helping the body? How is that helping anyone? It's not. Matter of fact, there were those preachers who would have eloquent prayers. Matthew 6 says, and they would go on the street corners and stand up with their hands in the air and pray out loud. La, 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 la. And he says, You're, you, you are wretched. You're doing this thing for men to see you when what you should be doing is go to your prayer closet and pray to your God. And what he sees in secret, he will reveal in, in, in the open. There's power in this relationship of prayer. And there's this growing of this language that the Lord's going to speak on your behalf. Amen? So that's the Holy Spirit. All right, let's continue on. It says in verse 27, And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So what is the Holy Spirit doing? He knows the will of God. He knows your mind already. He's knitted it together. But what is the purpose for this? To get you into the will of God. Because in the will of God, there's life. In the will of God, there's satisfaction. I have water you know not of. I have, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'm going to nourish this groaning that you're having right now. I'm going to grow you into the image of Christ. So this continues on. It says, and now this most famous verse, I think that many of us are, are, um, have memorized <laughs> because it is a stronghold, and if you don't have it memorized, I would say memorize this one. This is one you want in your pocket. When the, when the battles come, the Bible says in verse Romans 8.28, it's really easy, 8.8. 8.28, 8, remember that. We know that all things work together for the good of them who love God, who are called according to his purposes. What is this number four that we can look to? God's perfect plan. God's perfect plan. It all will work out for good. What about the babies that are dying of cancer? What about this and this? this what kind of God would allow this and that? And, you know, I'm starving over here. Rah, 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 rah. You see, as through a dim lit lens. But God works everything together. Even the wicked devices of the devil will work to your advantage. He's going to turn the whole thing around for the benefit of you and to his glory. His plan is perfect. Are you resting in his plan? Are you trusting in his plan? Or, we need to fix this now. We need to fix that now. And we're running and controlling everything in the midst of the storm. Or are you just enjoying the storm? There's some beauty in watching lightning on the lake. I don't know if you guys have ever gone out there, man, but... I say this. So, so when I was in um, Tucson, Arizona, I was, a, I was a security guard in a halfway house, literally a 17-story building with thousands of people and over 250 gangs, just, you know, in Tucson. Crips and Bloods, all kinds of gangs. And I'm walking around with a weapon. And, and, and so I would go up to the roof a lot to get away from everybody and sleep. Um, but as I'm up on the roof, you would, see, you would see lightning storms. There'd be a band of sun in the middle and lightning storms on either side. And it was so beautiful, guys. I'm like in the midst of this, and you're, you're terrified, yet you know the Lord is with you. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm strengthened, and I'm, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm praying to God, and all of a sudden a lightning bolt hits the rod, literally 20 feet above my head. And I dropped to my knees in the middle of the crawl and ran inside. <laughs> I was in the midst of the awe, but there's beauty in the storm. There's beauty in seeing the power of God's providence. Knowing the might, and that's just a tiny taste. A lightning bolt. It's nothing. Isn't it? It's nothing. Compared to God. Didn't he throw the sun out there? And every other star? A lot more power in those stars. If he's for you. And you're in his plan. And he's omniscient. All knowing. Why are we trusting in his plan? He's going to work it out. It's going to work out. I don't care what you're addicted to. I don't care what you're struggling with. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. 
enter into rest of God who's got it planned out. He's going to work it out. Assurance of God's plan. Let's continue on in verse 29. It says, And for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to conform into the image of his Son, that we might be firstborns among the brethren. Just continuing on, then that same precept of God's providence is he who begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of his return. He's a good father. He's going to rear you in the ways that are righteous. And what does the Bible say? Raise a child in the way which they should go and they will not depart from it. Well, if you're a child of God, last week's message title, then don't you think God's going to continue to rear you? He's not left you. He's going to pop you on the behind when you need a pop on the behind. He's going to focus your head where it belongs, where it needs to belong. If you, are you here? Let me ask you something. How many here have sinned? Don't raise your hand, please. How many here of you have sinned this week? Think about it. How many of you have sinned today? Rebelling. In your heart. But you're here. Amen? You're here. God's got you. He's going to bring you back on track. God's sovereignty is perfect. He'll even use your weaknesses and your mistakes to your benefit when you turn back to him. Awesome. Awesome. He makes beauty from ashes. ashes. Amen. So let's continue on in verse 30. It says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, to him also he called. For whom he called, then he also justified and whom he justified, he also glorified. If he called you, and you accepted this calling, and you've become a child of God, now he makes it as though you've never sinned. Just as if I never sinned. You've been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's just as though it never happened. You're new. He makes all things new. He's continuing to do this work in you. Don't count it strange, these diverse and trials and temptations you're going through. For they are for the trying of your faith. He's training you up. For what? To grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. To be a son and daughter of God Almighty. Amen? Amen. God's providence. God's providence. Continues on in verse 31. It says, For what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give all things? What does this say? Number five, number, number six. God is our defense. God is our defense. You are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. You, have, you are victorious. No weapon form shall prosper against you that are in God. Why are you fearful? It may look like it's having an effect, and it may look like you're losing the battle, but you hear. It says, run into the strong power of the Lord. He's our strong defense. You're on a rock that the storms cannot knock down. Immovable. God, not you. God's your defense. Why are you defensive? Why isn't everything someone says, get your goat? I'm hungry. I'm hangry. What do they say? I'm hangry. I'm hungry and I'm angry. Everything you say disgusts me. Who's your defense? We need jerk and we react. I talked about this, how Satan uses this reverse psychology on everybody and gets us fighting between one another. Takes these groanings and this, and this, this waiting and he says, he ain't coming. I got you, you're mine. No. He's a strong defender. He's our, our mighty one. The, 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 the one that nobody can come against. Not all things, not all creation can come against God Almighty who speaks into existence. And he that giveth, giveth, and he that taketh away, taketh away. He's our defense. Why are you defending yourself? You know, I, I talk to you guys, I talk to other people about this. I used to be extremely apologetic. I have the scriptures I've studied since I was this big, so I can, I can sit there and retort or debate with anybody. If anything you're getting out of this message, I want you to understand, it's not by power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord, that the victory comes. It's not you. 
It's God. He's your defender till the end. He will see you through it. Stop feeling weak and stop taking control of yourself and stop letting Satan box you around. Stop playing in his playground. Run to the strong tower. He's a defender of those who are in the faith. Amen? Yes. Verse 33 goes on to say, Who shall lay these things into charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Listen, guys. I think there's no greater torment than when we've been in sin and the accuser of the brethren comes to you and exposes it. Exposes your ugliness. You know, we're talking about everyone putting on these scary, horrifying masks for Halloween. And we look in this mirror and I'm like, oh, I got my hair, I just did my hair, I got it all perfect, there's a few out, I had to clip off today, it's all trim and perfect. But as I look into the law of God, I see a ghoul. I see a ghoul, a nasty looking, you know, there's this guy on Twitter, that, 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 that TikTok, and again, seducing spirits, I'm not condoning TikTok. <laughs> Be wise when you go into that world. There's a lot of sorcery, witchcraft, and darkness there, and brainwashing. But there's a guy out there who twists his face around when he's singing songs. When I look at my face in the Word of God, I see a twisted face. But when I look at my face, as I look to the Lord's face, I see, as we said yesterday, an angel, a messenger of God, a child of God, a chosen of God, a beloved of God. He's telling us here, when the, when the accusers come, and by the way, sometimes we give Satan too much credit. Who's the greater accuser of the brethren? Yourself. Me. I'm my biggest critic, and by the way, there's a lot of them in the church sometimes. Praise be to God, this is not a church like that. Praise be to God, people come into this, into this, into this room and let it all off and say, I'm a man undone among the people that are undone. Amen? Amen? Praise be to God, this is not a place of condemnation, but a place of conviction and conversion, yes. of growing, of healing. Yes. That's why we're here. There's going to be one who accuses. He's going to get his. But the Lord is our defense, and it's God who justifies you. Remember that in your mind. It's God that makes it as though you've done nothing. It's him who takes your sins away by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Remember that. It's so important in this growing phase. God's our defense. Let's continue on, and we're going to close in these final scripture verses with the final precept, number seven. And I think it will become quite apparent what that final one is. Verse 34, we're going to read it all the way through to 39. It says, And who is, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of God, love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress, shall persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. It is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep led to a slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things for the present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Does anyone know what the last one is? Love. Love personified in Jesus Christ. No greater love is there than one laid on his life for his friends. The personification of love. The Bible says God is love. And if I want to know what love is, I look to Jesus. That example that my eyes, my ears, and this flesh can see. If there's anything that's happened, is Christ has made, it, made an opening for you to enter into relationship with God Almighty by love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whom shall ever believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Amen? Amen. Love. This is love.
God desires none should perish, but all should come to repentance and be saved. Love. Love. Jeremiah 29.11 says, this is if you're curious about God's thoughts towards you. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. I love you. I've done everything to find you. My eyes went all around, and I found you, you lost sheep, and I put you on my shoulder. You think I'm going to let the wolf take you away? You think I'm going to let the lion come roar and devour you? You think I'm going to let the bear sneak in? You're my child. I am a good shepherd. I love you. Love helps us endure all things. Listen, you can beat yourself into submission, as Paul says, in a physical sense. But if you can be convinced into church, and I told you this, I started this off by saying a little bit that I was apologetic in my ways before, where I would defend faith. God needs me to defend. But if I can convince somebody into the kingdom, they can be convinced out of the kingdom. But if they're in God, they're never snatched from his hand. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. Not even you. Not even you, Christian. Endure. Because when somebody is motivated by love, the Bible says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. When I see evil as evil, it loses its savor. And when I taste and see the goodness of God, I'm charged. I'm charged and said, that's what's right. I do it because God is love. And I do it because it's righteous to love. It's the right thing to do. And it keeps you. And there's no power in the world or anywhere that's greater than love. Right. Remember, the Bible talked about these speaking in tongues and all these giftings. And what does it, God say the greatest is above all things? If you do anything, if you get anything out of this, love endures all things. It perseveres. Love gets you through. Even if you don't know the end, live in love and you'll live in life. Guys, guys, let's, I'm going to close with this final scripture verse. I skipped a ton, but we only have so much time. So I just praise God for the time we have had. And I pray to God that he's spoken to you. It says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. This is Paul speaking. Again, who's in that struggle. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended in verse 13, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto those things which are before, I press on towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Press on. Press on children of God. This is just a season. I know you're groaning. Move on by faith. I skipped that verse, but when you talk about hope, is the substance of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Amen? Walk by faith. Walk by faith. Believe in God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word that speaks to the, to the marrows of our bones, to the depths of our groaning, and satisfies us like nothing else. I pray, Father, that you would continue to be that, that uh, messenger in our hearts and our minds. And, Father, that we would see that you're never going to leave us nor forsake us, that you're going to work all things together for the good of those that love you and are called according to your purposes. It's your providence that we're saved, and it's your providence that we rest in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.